In this lesson we're going to be exploring compound angle formulas and adding to our our knowledge base of different trigonometric identities that we can make use of. In this case let's start off with something fairly simple. We've got the unit circle here and I'm describing two different angles on the unit circle. I'm going to call one of those angles A and the other one B. And these angles are going to be measured in both cases these angles will be measured from the positive x-axis. So that's how I'd measure those two angles. Well if I take those two angles together then here is the first one the angle A. So if I imagined if I draw it again if that's my positive x-axis then from here to here is A and from here to here is B and so that means that the angle that's between those two is going to be A which was the larger angle minus B which was the smaller angle. The other thing to remember is that the endpoints of each of these terminal arms can be described in terms of their coordinates. So this would be the first X coordinate and this would be the first Y coordinate. This would be the second X coordinate. This would be the second Y coordinate. So this point at the end of the terminal arm for angle A the X coordinate is simply the cosine of the angle A. The Y coordinate is the sine. Similarly for this terminal arm at the end of the angle B has an X coordinate cosine B, Y coordinate sine B. We're going to be making use of that in just a moment. And how we're we going to make use of that is we're actually going to combine the cosine law and the distance formula. So I think it's worth it actually. I should have copied that over. Let's just have a quick reminder. So here's here's my point A which is at cosine A sine A. I guess I shouldn't call that point A. How about we call that point P1? And then we have the point P2 which is at cosine B sine B and then the angle between here is A minus B and then between those two points would be the distance uh, let's call that distance 1, 2. So I'm going to relate these things to each other and the reason I can relate these things to each other is that first of all the distance formula describes the distance between two points in terms of the x and y coordinates. Well I have x and y coordinates for those two points. The cosine law describes the um, the length of the side opposite to the angle, in this case my angle of interest is A minus B, in terms of the other sides. And I guess I should start now by labeling some other things. We said this was the unit circle which means this side is length 1 and this side is length 1. So if I start to put these things together, and I'm going to do one at a time. So let's start with the cosine law. So the cosine law says c squared equals a squared plus b squared minus 2ab cosine of the angle c. Let's try that again. but I don't have A, B, and C. What I have is this distance. So the C squared is actually, I'm just going to call that the distance D squared. The side A is going to be this side of the triangle, which is simply 1 squared. The side B is this side of the triangle, plus 1 squared, minus 2 times 1 times 1, times the cosine of the angle contained between those two sides which is A minus B. So I actually haven't done anything here other than change some labeling. And let's go ahead and simplify that. That becomes 1 squared plus 1 squared is just 1 plus 1. That's equal to 2. 2 times 1 times 1 is simply 2 cosine of A minus B. Now let's go ahead and use the distance formula the distance formula, so let's separate that out. Now to apply the distance formula, that's equal to x2 minus x1. Now just alphabetically AB, I'll call this 
x2 minus x1, it actually doesn't matter the order that I do this. So I realize I'm just going to write this alphabetically. So I'm just going to call that x2 minus x1. That's going to be cosine. Well, I guess I should be consistent. I called this point 2. It doesn't really matter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm just going to relabel this. Call that point 1 and call that point 2. It doesn't actually matter. I'm only doing this so that as I write this out, this is going to make visually a little bit more sense to you, whoever's watching this. So it's going to be x2 minus x1, which is going to be cosine a minus cosine b all squared plus sine a minus sine b all squared and that whole thing square rooted. Now immediately I'm going to recognize that I'm actually to match these things up eventually I'm going to be interested in d squared. So I'm going to go ahead and square both sides of this and that's going to get rid of this square root sign. That's going to leave me with cos a minus cos b all squared plus sine a minus sine b all squared and I'm going to expand this. So this is a perfect square expansion that becomes cosine squared a minus 2 cos a cos b plus cosine squared b plus and then I do the same perfect square expansion here for sine and I end up with sine squared a minus 2 sine a sine b plus sine squared b so d squared is equal to now I can do a little bit of simplification here and the simplification I'm going to do is I'm going to make use of I'm just gonna write it maybe over here to the side I'm going to suggest you recall that sine squared theta plus cos squared theta is equal to 1 that's known as the Pythagorean identity but I have a, if you notice, I have a sine squared a and a cos squared a, and they're both positive. That means they're being added. So those together become 1. And then I have a sine squared b and a cos squared b. So those together become 1. So I'm adding 1 and 1 there. And then I have the rest of this, which is minus 2 cos a cos b minus 2 sine a sine b and just to finish simplifying this I end up with 1 plus 1 is 2 minus 2 cos a cos b minus 2 sine a sine b but this d squared must be equal to this d squared so now I can actually put these two things together so let's just keep in mind this first one so I get 2 minus 2 cosine of a minus b is equal to 2 minus 2 cosine a cosine b minus 2 sine a sine b. These 2's are going to cancel. I've got a 2 on both sides, a positive 2 and a positive 2. They cancel to be 0. Similarly, I've got negative 2, negative 2, negative 2, so I'm going to divide everything by negative 2. Divide by negative 2. And where that takes me is that the cosine of a minus b is actually equal to, so I divided by negative 2 here, I just got cos of a minus b. I divide this by negative 2, I get cosine of a cosine of b. And divide this by negative 2, it becomes plus sine a sine b. So now we actually have this formula which says that the cosine of an angle minus another angle can actually be expressed in terms of the cosine of the first angle, the cosine of the second angle, plus the sine of the first angle, the sine of the second angle. We could go through this exercise again and we could actually come up with an expression for cosine of a plus b and it turns out that that is cosine of a cosine of b minus sine of a 
sine of v. So those two, there's the first one, and there's the second one, and those can be obtained through an algebraic manipulation of the cosine law and the distance formula. And I'm not going to go through that full derivation. Here's how you start it. The difference here is that the angle B would be down here in the fourth quadrant. So that would mean that the angle, an angle down here would be represented as negative B. Then we use the cast rule to realize that that's the same as negative sine B. And then we end up with this expression. We can use this principle to go a little further because we can start to express things. What about a compound angle formula for sine? We just did one for cosine. But we've talked in the previous lesson, we talked about some other equivalent expressions and the fact that sine and cosine are related to each other by the fact of complementary angles. So we have this equivalent complementary angle expression. So I can actually rewrite sine of a plus b that is actually equal to the cosine of bracket pi over 2 minus a plus b. That's using this expression. My theta in this case is equal to a plus b. So that would be pi by 2 minus theta. But we've just talked about different ways that we can express this. Now, if you, I'm just going to show you this just to explain, because this is an important idea when you're getting into trigonometric identities, which is one of the reasons why we're developing these. You might look at this and say, well, hey, we just did a formula for cosine of one angle minus another angle. So I can actually write this as the cosine of pi over 2 times the cosine of a plus b. And let's see, there's a minus sign there. That means I'm going to put a plus here. That's going to be plus the sine of pi over 2, the sine of a plus b. And if I think about cosine of pi by 2, cosine of pi by 2 is actually equal to 0 times the cosine of a plus b. And the sine of pi by 2 is equal to 1 times the sine of a plus b. And if you notice this, well, this 0 times 0, this whole thing turns into 0. And 1 times this, that just gives me sine of a plus b. And I've gone in a complete circle, and I've just shown that sine of a plus b is actually equal to sine of a plus b. Now, why did I spend the time to do that? I'd like to think I wasn't completely wasting time doing that. What I was doing was trying to demonstrate to you that it's possible to go down some wrong paths when you're doing identities like this and you have to be careful of that because um, sometimes it just brings you back to where you started and you just have to accept that and move on and try something else so in this case I, the, the alternate that I'm going to try is I'm going to group things a little differently so I'm going to write this as pi over 2 minus a minus b just expanding out that bracket but now the grouping I'm going to do is I'm going to group pi over 2 minus a is going to be my first angle, call that theta 1, and this b is going to be my second angle. So when I use my compound angle formula for cosine, I'm going to use this as my first angle. So that's going to become the cosine of the first angle. So let me, um, before I get there, I wouldn't normally write this, but I'm just going to remind you. So that's the cosine of theta 1, cosine of theta 2, plus the sine of theta 1, the sine of theta 2. Normally, I would just go directly to this. So I'm going to say the cosine of pi by 2 minus a, cosine of b, plus the sine of pi by 2 minus a, the sine of b. Now this is interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's taking us down a path that's actually going to get us somewhere. But this cosine of pi by 2 minus a, that is that complementary angle formula that we talked about in a previous lesson. So this is actually the same thing as the sine of a times the cosine of b. 
and then plus the sine of pi by 2 minus a, that's actually the same as the cosine of a times the sine of b. And so because of that, we have now expressed sine of a plus b is actually sine a cos b plus cos a sine b. So that is the sine of a plus b and that is the result we were looking for here. That's the compound angle formula for a sine when you add two angles and then there's also a compound angle formula for sine when you subtract and that one is equal to sine a cos b minus cos a sine b. Now what about tangent? For tangent we're going to start off with this definition of sine over cos. So the tangent of a plus b is actually equal to the sine of a plus b over the cosine of a plus b. Now this one's going to get algebraically it's going to it's going to be more difficult than the ones we looked at here. It's not terrible but it is it's more involved. So we're going to use what we just obtained which is the sine of a plus b is sine a cosine b plus cos a sine b all over cosine of a plus b is cos a cos b minus sine a sine b. Now we can split this numerator up using the same denominator but there's no good way for us to split up that denominator. So I can write this successfully as the sine of a the cosine of b over that entire denominator cos a cos b minus sine a sine b. Now please keep in mind that I'm doing this with a, a purpose. I, I know where I'm trying to get with this. When it was originally derived, when, when people were exploring alternate forms, ways to, to express this, it would have been someone with good algebraic skills was just experimenting with the different ways that they could rearrange this and, and write it in a way that was useful and meaningful. I'm going to get rid of this. Um, it's just clutter for now. So from here what am I going to do? Now I've got all these sines and cosines and, and it's important to keep an eye on what it was you were starting with which is tangent. So really I think I'd like to express my double angle formula for tangent in terms of tangent. Now, I'd, ideally to do that, I'd like to, maybe I've got a sine here, I'd like to divide it by a cosine. I don't know what to do about this cosine. Do I divide by sine and try to turn it into a cotangent? So what I'm going to do is leave that numerator alone for now. And in this denominator, I'm actually going to divide out or factor out cos A, cos B. And if I take factor out a cos a cos b that's going to just turn that first term into a 1 but now I have sine a sine b over cos a cos b in the denominator and if you reverse this operation if I multiplied cos a cos b back into this bracket this 1 would become cos a cos b and it would divide out with this denominator and we'd just end up with sine A sine B again. Cos A sine B in the second term and once again I'm going to divide out or I'm going to factor out cos A cos B and I get 1 minus sine A sine B over cos A cos B. Sorry. But this is useful because I have now, if you notice, I have cos b and cos b in the numerator and denominator. So those divide out and become ones. 
I have sine a over cos a, which means the numerator now just becomes tan a. And in the denominator, so I've combined sine a and cos a together to become tan a. So the only thing that's left is this, what's in these brackets, which is 1 minus. But if we take a look at this, we've got sine a over cos a, which is tan a. And we've got sine b over cos b, which is tan b. Plus, over here, I have cos a over cos a. That divides out to become 1. And I've got sine b over cos b. And that just becomes tan b. And now the only thing that's left in this denominator is 1 minus sine a over cos a. 1 minus sine a over cos a is tan a. Sine b over cos b is tan b b. And as you can see, these two denominators are the same. And even though I split these before, now I'm going to bring things back together. And I end up with tan a plus tan b over 1 minus tan a tan b. And that is my, let's just bring this over. That is my expression for the tangent of A plus B. And for those who are interested, I will leave you tan A minus B to work on as an exercise. It's something that we'll be covering in class. So for those of you who want to test your algebraic skills, you can go ahead and see if you can duplicate this for tan of a minus b. Very similar procedure and see what you come up with. Okay, now how can we make use of this? Here I've got cosine, cosine, sine, sine. So in this case, I can make use of my compound angle formula. You have to remember these. You, these have to be familiar to you. Yes, you will, in mo most cases, you'll have access to a paper copy of these. But in this case, I remember that the cosine of A minus B is the one that gives me cos A cos B plus, the important part is that plus sine A, and I'm going to run out of room, sine b. So I can actually rewrite this as the cosine of 7 pi by 12 minus 5 pi by 12, which is simply the cosine of 2 pi by 12. And that's equal to the cosine of pi by 6. And I remember my special triangles and Remembering special triangles may mean you have them memorized in your head, but if not, you always feel free to write them down. That did not take me long to reproduce that. The cosine of pi by 6 is adjacent over hypotenuse, so that is equal to the square root of 3 divided by 2. As opposed to having to go through all of this, put things in your calculator, um, you can see we, can't, we were able to come up with an exact value there. And now I ask, determine an exact value for the tangent of negative 5 pi by 12. So convert to a related acute angle and apply cast. And sometimes, some of you may still be more comfortable working in degrees. That's entirely up to you. Negative 5 pi by 12. So the first thing I'm going to do is take a look at, now I'm looking at negative angles. So that would be net 0, but I'm going to kind of go the other way. That's negative pi by 2. That's negative pi. That's negative 3 pi by 2 because going clockwise is negative angles. But I want by 12. So I might want to express these in terms of a denominator 12. Well that's negative 6 pi by 12. And this one is negative 12 pi by 12. Well, Negative 5 pi by 12 is actually right there. So there is negative 5 pi by 12, which means I can express this in terms of 2 pi 
minus 5 pi by 12. So my related acute angle, so my related acute angle is actually 5 pi by 12. And so the tangent of negative 5 pi by 12 is actually, and if I just remember cast, so that is related to the tangent of positive 5 pi by 12. How is it related? We are in quadrant 4, which cosine is the only one that's positive, so that's the negative tan of 5 pi by 12. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write that as, I'm going to need a little bit more room here, so I think what I'll do is I'm going to take this whole thing, bring it down here so I can use the full width of my paper, and that is equal to, now, 5 pi by 12, actually a little bit more rough work to do here. And this is what I meant when I said you might want to convert this to degrees and back to radians. You have to come up with two angles, and ideally you want to come up with two special angles that add or subtract, that combine in some way of adding and subtracting to give me 5 pi by 12. So you might actually want to multiply this by 180 degrees over pi and that gets rid of the pi values um, 180 so 12 that goes in there 15 5 times 15 is 75 degrees and now you have to ask yourself what combination of 30 degrees 45 degrees and 60 degrees is going to give me 75 degrees and hopefully you can see that it's these two added together so that's equal to 30 degrees plus 45 degrees but that's the same as pi by 6 plus pi by 4. If you can get to this yourself mentally, even better. That just shows a, a strong understanding of and comfort, comfort with working with fractions. So now that I have figured that part out, I can now write this as the negative tan of pi by 6 plus pi by 4. And I can use the formula that we derived just a page or two ago. Now this negative sign is going to have to stay out in front the whole time. So tangent of A plus B, which is what we looked at here. Tangent of A plus B is tan A plus tan B over 1 minus tan A tan B. So that's equal to negative, and I'm just going to put a big bracket around that, the tangent of A, uh, tangent of A, which is pi over 6, plus the tangent of B, which is pi over 4, over 1 minus the tangent of A, which is pi by 6, tangent of B, which is pi by 4. And now I need to fill these in, and again, there's my special triangle, pi by 6, pi by 3, 1, 2, root 3, and my pi by 4, pi by 4, 1, 1, root 2. So that's equal to negative bracket, being careful here. Tangent of pi by 6 is opposite over adjacent. So that's going to be tangent of pi by 6 is going to be 1 over root 3 plus the tangent of pi by 4 which is opposite over adjacent and that's going to be equal to 1 over 1 minus the tangent of pi by 6 we already know that's 1 over root 3 but this time we're multiplying by the tangent of pi by 4 which is times 1. So now keep working forward, working to simplify this. One, 1 over root 3 plus 1 is the same as 1 plus, let's do this quite carefully, 1 over root 3 plus root 3 over root 3, giving them a common denominator, over root 3 over root 3, which is this 1 turned into root 3 over root 3, minus 1 over root 3. 
which is equal to negative stays in front. So this becomes 1 plus root 3 over root 3 all over root 3 minus 1 over root 3. I've got a fraction over a fraction. So the way I resolve that is I take the first fraction and I multiply it by the reciprocal of the second. So that's going to become root 3 over root 3 minus 1. The root 3's here and here divide out and they just become 1. So now I end up with equals negative bracket 1 plus root 3 over root 3 minus 1. And whether I bring in this negative sign now or later doesn't really matter. So I think what I'll do is I'm just now going to rationalize this denominator which means I multiply top and bottom by root 3 plus 1, root 3 plus 1. And I end up with the negative sign stays out front for now. And I'm going to get 1 plus root 3 times root 3 plus 1, which is actually just a perfect square. So that's going to work out to be um, 1 times 1 is 1 plus, and I've got root 3, I've got two of them, so that's going to be plus 2 root 3, plus root 3 times root 3 is simply equal to 3. Or, yes, you know what, I'm just going to put that in as plus the square root of 9. And then in the denominator, I get root 3 times root 3. This is a difference of squares, so root 3 times root 3 is root 9. Negative 1 times positive 1 is minus 1. So simplifying, I'm not, I'm not cutting any corners here. Uh, square root of 9 is 3, plus 1 is 4. So that's 4 plus 2 root 3 over square root of 9 is 3 minus 1. 3 minus 1 is 2. And I've got, I can divide everything by 2. So 2 goes into 2 once, 2 goes into 4 twice, 2 goes into 2 once. And so my final answer, if I multiply in this negative sign now, this is over 1, so the fraction goes away. That becomes negative 2 minus root 3 is my final answer. And you could verify that by using your calculator. Okay, that's it. I think that was a fairly long lesson, but uh, that was just simply because there was a lot of writing involved as we worked through those derivations and those couple of examples. So uh, a tougher lesson some of you are going to find this quite complicated so make sure you take your time and give your full attention to, the, to doing these homework questions and looking back at the examples that I've given.